For once, this talk won't revolve around a book, but a tangible relic, a tiny fragment of the past that harks back to Dickens's last Christmas and ultimately to his far from idyllic childhood. And here it is. I can't see shit. What's that? Zoom in. Still can't see it. OK, cut. Ah, that's more like it. It's what seems to be a copper coin depicting a fighting cock seeing its own reflection, which it takes for a rival, in a freshly polished boot, with the curious explanation that this scene depicts the effects of Warren's blacking. And on the other side, there's a rather more straightforward piece of information. An address, 30 Strand, a company name, Warren's blacking, and images of a boot and a gentleman. If the ghost of Charles Dickens were to be confronted with this little item, I feel sure it would rattle its chains and let out a prolonged low moan. But why would that be? Let me take you back to Christmas Day, 1869. Dickens's last Christmas on Earth and the scene after lunch at Gad's Hill, where Dickens is celebrating, in a subdued way, with eight members of his family, his bubble of companionship. There was his eldest son and namesake, Charles Dickens Jr., now the author's deputy editor and soon to succeed his father as editor of All the Year Round, with his wife Bessie and their seven-year-old daughter Mary, known as Meckety. Dickens was never to be addressed as grandfather, it made him feel old, but as the Venerables. Then there was his daughter Katie, with her husband Charles Collins, Wilkie's younger brother. He was a prolific contributor to All the Year Round and had been commissioned by Dickens to design the cover for the serialised parts of the author's latest novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood, which would forever remain a mystery as Dickens didn't live to complete it. The Collins's marriage was a sham and may never have been consummated. Charles was gay and he was dying, slowly and painfully, of stomach cancer. There was his unmarried daughter Mamie, and his estranged wife's younger sister, Georgina Hogarth, who between them looked after Dickens and the Gads Hill residence, and after the author's death, preserved and protected the official version of his life. Finally, there was Henry Fielding Dickens, who had come down from Cambridge for the Christmas vacation. He was the one Dickens boy who was sent to university, and he went on to have a highly successful career in the law. All the other boys had been packed off to far-flung corners of the empire at an early age. Frank was in India. Alfred and Edward were in Australia. Sidney the sailor was somewhere on the high seas and Walter was already dead, succumbing to fever in India at the age of 25. Dickens was physically and mentally exhausted, suffering badly from gout, reclining on a sofa and barely participating in the festive entertainment. His surviving correspondence from the preceding few days give us a flavour of the author's state of mind. He was working on his new novel, Edwin Drood, and confided to John Forster that he'd miscalculated the length of the first two monthly parts and had to rejig them to fill the requisite number of pages. He was simultaneously revising the working scripts for the farewell series of readings from his novels dealing with insurance on his conservatory and appointing a new head gardener. Dickens's last recorded correspondence before Christmas Day was an exasperated telegram sent on December the 24th to his business manager, George Dolby, to whom he had consigned the task of purchasing and dispatching a turkey from Ross on Wye. Where is that turkey? It has not arrived! Apparently, said turkey was loaded with other parcels into a horse box in Gloucester, which caught fire en route and was destroyed. One wonders if the turkey wasn't rather just slightly overcooked. What the Dickens family actually ate on December the 25th, 1869, hasn't survived in the records, but it's unlikely that anyone went hungry. So here are the family assembled after lunch to while the afternoon away with parlour games. Someone decided they should play the memory game, a perennial favourite. I used to play it with English language learners as the picnic game. You start by saying, we went on a picnic and with us we took some apples. 
The next person repeats this and adds, for example, a basket, then half a pound of cheese, then a box of dates, and so on, with each person adding a new item that begins with the next letter of the alphabet. Oh. Bored at home? Try this game with animals at the zoo or things you take on holiday. But back to Dickens on the sofa. He loved this game and decided to join in. When it was his turn to contribute, he faultlessly reeled off all the previous miscellaneous objects and then added Warren's Blacking 30 Strand. Henry Dickens recalled this detail in his 1928 memoirs, our source for this anecdote, and noted that he gave this with an odd twinkle in his eye and a strange inflection in his voice, which at once forcibly arrested my attention and left a vivid impression on my mind for some time afterwards. To the game players, however, this was at the time no more than a random snippet from Dickens's encyclopedic knowledge of London's streets. Warren's blacking was long gone from the Strand, and there was no particular reason to imagine the address held any personal signification for the famous author. It was only when John Forster's three-volume Life of Dickens began appearing in November 1871 that the crucial significance of this detail began to emerge, and it's since taken on ever greater importance in our understanding of the author and the wellsprings of his imagination. But in the manner of cliffhanger serialisations, I'm going to keep you hanging on for a resolution of this mystery until next time. Just remember, Warren's Blacking 30 Strand. Warren's Blacking 30 Strand. Let's